This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores different areas of the arts and media. Join me, your host Paula Blair, and the researchers, practitioners, and enthusiasts I meet along the way. See our website at audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com and other links in the show notes for more information. For now, enjoy the show. Hello, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Audiovisual Cultures. We're taking a virtual trip to Hollywood today with my very special guest, Pam Munter, who is a former actor, a musician, an author, and a film historian. We do love those on this show. We'll mainly be talking to Pam about her latest book of short stories and plays, Fading Fame. Women of a Certain Age in Hollywood, published this year in 2021 with Adelaide Books. Before that, though, I'd really love to give a very warm welcome to Pam. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. Hi, Pam. Hi, Paula. So, thank you for having me. This is quite a pleasure to be speaking to another film historian. That's a rare treat for me. Awesome. That's great. I'm hoping we can get into some proper nerdy business about film, uh, especially early film in Hollywood. Um, and I can learn a few things from you as well. Before we talk about your book as well, just wanted to ask, how are you doing? Whereabouts are you joining us from? I live in Palm Desert, California, which is about two hours east of Los Angeles. It's in the desert. It's really interesting when you think back to early, early cinema and read about basically what a desert California was, you know, the whole of it before Hollywood was built out of that arid landscape. We're catching up with that a little bit later on with your work. Would you be happy to tell us a bit more about yourself uh, and your work and your interests? Sure. Uh, I had the good fortune, I think, to be born and raised in Los Angeles, which is a stone's throw from Hollywood. Uh, My parents, though, weren't into the business at all, nor were any of the neighbors. They were pretty solid, traditional, blue-collar kind of folks. But my mother took me to a, a film when I was five years old, believe it or not. And I remember the movie even. And I was hooked. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's the kind of life I want to know more about. I wanted to be in it. I mean, it was so different from my everyday life with housewives gossiping about their husbands and drinking coffee. And it just made me crazy. I just couldn't imagine a life like that. So I kept going to movies. Even as a kid, I spent my babysitting money going to movies. And where I grew up, uh, even though my parents weren't in the business, a lot of people were. I went to school with some famous kids. In my uh, high school, for instance, there was Ryan O'Neill and Sandra Dee and Nancy Sinatra and a lot of the kids of celebrities. Sitting next to me in my English class was a Mouseketeer. (laughs) You remember those? (laughs) So fame just didn't seem that far away to me. You know, it seemed like a doable thing. But back in those days, Paula, there was no mass media telling us what these people were really like that we saw on the screen. The Hollywood was controlled by five major studios and five white men who were lord and master of their domain. And the only thing we knew about these stars that we adored came from the publicity departments of those studios who funneled the information to movie magazines. That was it. That was all we had. You know, there was no cable TV. There was no, not even any uh, National Enquirer, you know, <laughs> or any uh, newspapers that would tell the truth because all of that was controlled by the studios who were very wealthy and usually pillars of their communities. But, you know, I never quite bought that. I always wondered, even as a kid, could all these people be so frigging happy all the time? <laughs> I didn't understand. You know, we saw pictures of women and men hugging and there were no gay people, of course. They were invented later on. (laughs) Uh, They were moving or they were vacationing or they were on the set and they were all immaculately dressed. And I just was so fascinated with that world. Well, I realized very young that even though I loved it and I wanted to be a movie star, as all kids did at that age, I knew that probably wasn't really likely. (laughs) So I went into other fields. I actually became a clinical psychologist and practiced uh, for a quarter of a century and saw a lot of celebrities in therapy, which was interesting and fun for me. 
But I always kept writing about the business. It was something that fascinated me. I wrote, I don't know, maybe two dozen articles, very lengthy articles on not so famous movie stars for some of the magazines like Classic Images and Films of the Golden Age, and the ones that told the truth <laughs> after the, the era of the five studios. And I loved doing that because I was afraid that people like, I don't know, Joan Blondell or Celeste Holm or Joan Davis would be forgotten. So I took a lot of time out of my life to do that. So I was writing nonfiction. That was my life. I read it. I wrote it. I loved it. Never read fiction. Never liked fiction. It's not very politically correct to say since I've just produced a book of fiction, but <laughs> that's the truth. I had left the practice. We closed it down because of managed care. It was just so intrusive. It was very hard to feel ethical about doing lengthy psychotherapy when there was so much intrusion into the process from the outside. And I went into an MFA program in uh, performing arts, creative writing and performing arts. And I wrote an autobiography, a memoir, called As Alone As I Want to Be. And I was fine. I got through with that. And then the head of the department said, you know, you need a second field. I thought, uh oh, I'm in real trouble now because this is the only one I know. He said, why don't you try fiction? I thought, oh, man. Wow. <laughs> That's like saying, why don't you fly to Mars tomorrow morning? You know, I just didn't know how to do it, how to go about doing it. But then I thought, you know, I have an awful lot of information about Hollywood history in my head to serve no functional purpose at all to anyone. What happens if I take some of those stories, fictionalize them, and in some cases, uh, make them anonymous? Some of the stories in the book Fading Fame uh, aren't about a specific movie star, but about a collection of people. I thought, maybe I could get away with that. You know, maybe we could call that fiction because it was. You now, the stories I tell, there's one in particular about Joan Davis, who was a vaudeville performer. I don't know if that you're familiar with that name. Her history was amazing, really. She was in radio. She had her own shows on radio. She was did films for years. She had a hit television program called I Married Joan in the 50s. And then there was nothing. They canceled her show. What happened to Joan Davis? What happens to women who get too old? for the studios, for the public. No, they're no longer desirable. Even female comedians like Joan Davis apparently had a shelf life that ran out. So I wondered, I wondered a lot. I had written someplace years ago that she had had an affair with another comedian named Eddie Cantor, who's also very famous, more famous than she actually. Vaudeville, movies, all that kind of stuff, stage, a lot of stage work, television. I thought, I'm going to make a story out of that. I mean, I don't know if it's true. I don't know how long it went on. But coincidentally, both Joan Davis and Eddie Cantor had had homes just a few miles from where I live. <laughs> well, as a former researcher, I couldn't help myself. I had to drive over there and take a look, which I did. In Joan Davis's house, they were working on it. I don't know what they were doing. With it. Obviously, she didn't live there anymore. She was long dead, as was Cantor. But there were open doors, and I thought, oh, should I go in and look around? You know, it helped my story maybe if I knew exactly what the setting was. And then I stopped myself. I said, come on, come on. This isn't a research piece. This is fiction. Back off. But I discovered that even though they had long ended their affair, if they ever had one, they only lived a mile and a half apart in the Palm Springs area. So what a great story this could be. So that was the kind of way I fictionalized real stories for fading fame. And there were a couple of others like that, where I took the, a nub, just a little nugget of the reality and turned it into something I thought I could use. That's brilliant to hear. Yes. I wanted to thank you as well for so generously sharing the text of your book with me. I really enjoyed the short stories. I didn't manage to get to the plays, but I really enjoyed all of the stories. And that one was really poignant in particular. And I was wanting to ask you about to what extent you was anything from historical documentation and how true even is that in the first place? Um, and then how much of it was imagined, you know, and played with that sort of thing. So that's really interesting to hear. All that stuff was in my head. You know, I, I didn't have to do the research. I knew that Joan Davis had been an alcoholic, which she is in my story also, because of uh, biographies written by other actors who worked with her and talked about her difficulty functioning sometimes because of alcohol. In fact, a lot of the women in these stories drank too much. It was one way of coping, I suppose, with the loss of their fame. You know, people who were in that era of show business had nothing else. 
many of them started very young. Uh, in Mary Pickford's case, she was on stage at six, <laughs> you know, supporting her entire family on the vaudeville stage. No, not much education, which is true of all of these women. None of them were well-educated or college graduates. Few of them were high school graduates, for that matter. And they didn't go through the normal developmental stages. So their lives were filled with, dare I say, fame or the acquisition of it. And when that was gone, it's like their identity had just been stripped away. There was not much left. And as you say, it's poignant to see people who were so talented. Uh, Mary Pickford is a great example of that. And she was the first female executive in Hollywood. She ran her own studio, big star in the 20s. She was called America's Sweetheart, married Douglas Fairbanks, and they were this dashing couple all over the papers. And that's also in my story because anybody who knows Hollywood history knows Mary Pickford. I didn't really have to explain who she was. But a lot of her success was due to her screenwriter, Frances Marion, uh, and they became good friends. Now, I have them doing Frances Marion wanting a little more from Mary than friendship, but clearly fictionalized, I hope, I think. I don't know. I mean, who knows this stuff? But Mary Pickford had such a sad ending. She ran, silent films ran out and she ran out. I mean, there was not much left. She had gone through her entire career, even up to the age of 40, playing young girls with curly, wrinkly hair. And at 40, you know, you just can't get away with that too much anymore. And the public didn't want to see her as the actor she had become, as Mary Pickford. So she kind of faded away. The interesting part was that Frances Marion went straight up from there. She won two Academy Awards for screenwriting, the first woman, I think, to win two Academy Awards for writing film. And Mary, who the sad part to me is not just dissolving in alcohol, which is sad enough, but the fact that she lived in this mansion in Hollywood from the early 1920s through two husbands and ended up living there still as she died. You know, you think about movie stars, Norma Desmond, you know, the famous fictional character in Sunset Boulevard, and she wasn't too far from that. You know, it was a hard story to write, but I thought it was a story that needed to be told even fictionalized, because that's what happens to women who get too old. They get thrown away. Yes, I had thought about that comparison with Sunset Boulevard. That film was in my mind quite a bit when I was reading some of those earlier stories and how that's depicted. And I mean, it's made into a film noir and surrounded by you know, a murder and everything. It's glammed up a bit, but there's so much about what happened and, and who didn't make it when the talkies came in. Really sad. Yeah, it is sad. When technology comes in like that, a lot of people get left behind. Actually, with most of the men who got left behind, the women get uh, jettisoned because of their age, mostly. You know, the film moguls want someone they can imagine having sex with. And once they got into their late 20s, oh, no, sorry, you know, next. <laughs> they, they didn't want the ones that actually they had signed a contract. I recently watched Bombshell. I don't know if you've seen that film, but that's a very contemporary example of that very sort of thing happening at Fox News based on a real story. It's very prescient. So although your stories are set in the past, they're set in another century. Depressingly now, it's a very prescient issue is that idea of women needing to be stuck at a certain age and having value only because of what they look like. And it doesn't matter how talented they are or how committed they are, how hard they work or any of it. Yeah, so it's still very much with us. I particularly enjoyed the stories, Jerry's interview and The Curtain Never Falls, I think because as well as those stories that look at perhaps the more negative impact of all of this context, those two stories, they have a bit of a lift in them. And the characters uh, that are depicted, Geraldine Leonard and Maggie Bose, they get to be quite heroic in their own ways. So I was wondering, you know, if you had any thoughts on that, because there are more positive ending stories in the book as well. But also, are there any any other favorites of yours or any other highlights you'd like to mention? Well, The Curtain Never Falls came out of a single line I heard. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Rosemary. She's gone now, but she was probably best known for a television show called Dick Van Dyke Show. She was one of the main characters in that. But she had a long and illustrious career, again, on stage, nightclubs and stuff like that. She had, There was a documentary about her just before she died. And the interviewer said, you know, how are you doing? And da, 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 da. she says, you know, at night when I'm in bed, I go over my act. I thought, ah, oh, 
how poignant is that? Here's a woman 80 something at that point, and she's still thinking she's going to get back to it. So there's a story. There's got to be a story in that. And everything that came out of Maggie Bowe's story came from that one line in the documentary. So you never know when uh, inspiration is going to strike. Actually, my favorite story, I think, is the one that's called Dinner with Daddy. And it's the story of Irene Selznick, Irene Mayer Selznick, who was the younger daughter of uh, L.B. Mayer, the kingpin of MGM, really one of the founders of MGM, as in Metro Golden Mayer. <laughs> and I have her in the story coming back to the family mansion in Bel Air, which I have actually seen. And uh, it's been years since she'd been there. She doesn't know why she's there. It's a family dinner. And daddy's being daddy and ordering people around. And there's a butler and there's a younger sister, or older sister, actually, who is on her constantly. And all, like most of us, when we go home as adults, some of the old patterns <laughs> come back so easily in spite of ourselves. And we see that in Dinner with Daddy. There's a lot of history in Dinner with Daddy that I threw in, sort of incidentally. I have Irene challenging her father on why he would invite Charlie Chaplin to dinner with a high school girl. Well, it's, again, a fact that Charlie liked young girls. I don't know if he ever had dinner at L.B. Mayer's house. I don't know if they were friends. I don't know if they worked together. But it was an irresistible tidbit. I also threw in uh, in the story about Mary Pickford a tidbit about Peg Entwistle, who is a sort of a footnote to history. She uh, was a young actress who is probably best known for killing herself by jumping off the Hollywood sign, which is very sad. I, but I have her at the dinner party with Mary Pickford and Frances Marion. So any story where I can insert real history, even as a parenthetical aside, it's just more fun for me. And I think that's why I like this Selznick dinner with daddy story. And that's one that ends happily too, incidentally. I mean, she, one of the reasons the family is there is that they're announcing their divorce. And Irene helps her mother learn to cope with what she knows will be an awful ending in the family. Now, again, I don't know if that happened. I do know that uh, Irene sort of made her bones as a producer on Broadway in The Streetcar Named Desire in 1949. She completely changed careers, which one of the things that makes this such a positive story, I think she wasn't a victim like some of the others, sort of feels like they were. She made the best of a bad situation. Married to an awful person, David Selsen, Nick, who was obsessive compulsive and a womanizer. She had the good sense to leave. <laughs> so some of the stories, as you say, are positive. I don't know that whether they end well or not affects how I feel about them. Some of them are harder to write than others. Everything that mattered was very hard to write because it's about a real person who actually did kill herself, I whom I knew. So that made it a little tougher to write. In many cases, I had met these people in different settings. I, I had met Doris Day, for instance, a couple of times. I was a huge fan of Doris Day. I consider myself the world's expert on Doris Day. So I couldn't not put a story about her in the book, even though it's it's kind of dark comedy more than positive or negative. And she just never learns her lesson and never did, incidentally, <laughs> right up to the end. She always put her life in disreputable men's hands. It was a fun book to write, really. And, and as you suggest, all the stories are quite different. We have young women in their 40s who have been shipped out because of age. And we have older women like Ethel Barrymore, who's probably the oldest subject, who is on set with Frank Sinatra doing a film in which she kind of, it's not a walk-on, but it's a character part. It's not what she has been used to doing. And that was hard to write because I knew that she struggled in her later years. And I knew she was in that movie because I had seen it. It was one of my favorite films. I knew the lines and everything it was embarrassing. And I just had to include her in it somehow. So all these stories are a part of me, really. And they involve people that I felt some, some emotional connection with. In Jerry's interview, which you, you mentioned, she's in sort of a nursing home, sort of a last stage of life dementia process. And I knew an actress like that. I kind of watched her go through all those difficult stages. And she had people around her, which Jerry didn't have. She didn't have family, at least in this story. But I thought it was an important story to tell because all the memories, you know, when you get older like that, come flooding back, not necessarily in sequence. You know, she's an unreliable narrator. <laughs> we don't know if these things are true. She talks about a murder. You know, we don't know if this actually happened. The plays are a little different. You say you hadn't, hadn't read those. They are also a little bit about real people, but they're like 
lighter. There, there are dark comedy that's intended to be kind of an, oh my God, did she say that kind of <laughs> situation. Same theme though. It's you know, the post Me Too era. What happens to women after they pay their dues? What do they do with themselves? And how do they cope with that? And what are they willing to do to get it back? And one of the stories we see one of the women or in the plays, Janet Drake, Private Eye, we see two women who are fighting over the same role. And they're both older. You know, they've played it once. One of them played it on television. One of them played it in, on the radio. It tells you their age. And there's a movie now being made with this character. And both of these women want that part. Well, what are they going to do to get it? It was a fun thing to write because I sort of knew those people in a way. I hope you'll enjoy reading the plays when you get to them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, yes. Just thinking about drawing out more on some of those themes that you've mentioned as well. That idea of competitiveness just runs right through the whole thing. That how so many of these actresses and writers and musicians, performers in general, they were pitted against each other and pitted against other people and new things coming in all the time. And and just how much that eats away at them. And there's a, a lack of really developing deeper relationships that I hope has changed to an extent these days. Um, it seems that actors are more, or at least they will per- can maybe continue to perform solidarity and collaboration. But I don't know, I feel like some of that's more genuine these days. And so that's part of the pathos, I think, of so many of those stories is that they're underpinned by that competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that what has changed today for the better has been the strength of women's networking. You know, they didn't do that then. They they were at the mercy of men. Uh, Sadly, there are still no women at the head of studios. (laughs) They're still all white men, but more at the secondary and tertiary levels of authority. And they have helped other women, I think, rise. You know, it wasn't until the 70s that another woman ran a major studio after Mary Pickford in the 20s. It took them 50 years to do it, which is pretty amazing and discouraging. But sadly, that was not to last. That was a short-lived era. We had Sherry Lansing at 20th Century Fox, and I think she was a CEO at Paramount for a couple of years. We had Don Steele at Columbia and Amy Pascal and Stacey Snyder at Universal. But I don't think there are, I think a couple of them are dead, but I don't think any of them are in power anymore. Again, the competitive at that level was uh, every bit as vicious, if not more so, than competing for a part against a younger actress. It's a tough life. You're never quite good enough. Yeah, it's that idea of even if you're more than good enough, you just don't look the way somebody might want you to look or you're not prepared to do something that a producer wants you to do in private. I mean, hopefully the landscape's changing because you mentioned as well earlier that, of course, these were all white men, highly privileged people at the tops of these studios. And today we we maybe don't have studios, but there are certainly maybe independent production companies. So somebody like Ava DuVernay can have her own production company. And, you know, in a way we've come so far, but it's been such a difficult fight for somebody like that to, you know, not only have the gender barrier, but the racial one as well. So hopefully that landscape is changing, maybe not fast enough, but I don't know, there is a legacy to what these women suffered as you depict. Well, we still have Netflix and Amazon, you know, control the uh, cinematic universe. Uh, As you say, there are smaller independents, but then there's people like uh, Harvey Weinstein, who ran one of those smaller independents, who was notoriously predatory. Of course, we know that he's in jail, which is a good thing. And and many of his cohorts have had to resign their positions. It was a group of men at CBS who had to resign because of sexual harassment. And, uh, even uh, feminist Ellen DeGeneres had to explain to her fans why producers were harassing women on the set and fired them or they quit. I'm not sure what happened, actually. So you're right, it still goes on. I think that women banding together to help one another climb to wherever they want to go is probably the best antidote for the sexism in the industry. Talent is wonderful, but as we know, it's not enough. Yeah, very true. Are you interested in early access and behind the scenes extras? Then visit patreon.com forward slash AV cultures to check out our membership tiers. 
was wondering as well, Pam, who do you expect to be the reader for this book and do you have hopes for it? It would be great if your book could be part of that landscape of change. Yes, I would hope so. Uh, I've been a feminist since I was about eight and tried to get girls into Little League. <laughs> that, that wasn't possible back then. Uh, so I'm hoping that it will ring that bell loudly, that <clears throat> this is what we do to women and what we've always done to women in this business. And we need to rethink that. Uh, because it's not worth it. You know, people shelf life. It shouldn't be a matter of shelf life. It should be a matter of what they can contribute and for how long. My publicist was telling me that a lot of the people who are reviewing it are women. So I would guess that's the natural audience. I mean, the subtitle is Women of a Certain Age in Hollywood. But I think anyone who is curious about how things were, you don't have to be a film historian to be curious about how a Harvey Weinstein could happen and be a, such an ogre for so many years. You know, how did he get away with that? You know, the casting couch goes all the way back and it was a, a normal, accepted event. If a woman wanted to be up on that screen, she had to lie down on the couch first. That was just a, unfortunately a given. I don't know that that's true anymore. I don't think it is. Certainly there are those predators out there, but it's not as widespread as it once was. And I think anybody who cares about that issue will be curious about these stories. At least I hope so. It was fun to write because of the feminist background. And I, I'll say that because I was a clinical psychologist for so many years, I felt that I could get inside their heads and give the reader uh, some idea about how women think about these things, how they process that kind of oppressiveness and disappointment and uh, the edging process itself. You know, as we know, some of them did pretty well with that. I think the strength to my writing is always the internal dialogue. It's not so much what happens, it's how the, the woman processes the information. And that was extremely fun to write because I think I know more about that probably than anything, having been in practice so many years. Yes, I think there are a lot of the characters who tend to almost build themselves back up again by tearing down another woman. There's quite a lot of that. And that's part of the system. That's part of the culture. You know, you have to really put it in that context and remember that this is conditioning that everybody's going through. That's right. Part of that competitive nature. The adversarial nature of the business, I think, continues. I, I don't think that'll change. There are so few slots for stardom and so many people will want to get there. And not just women, of course, but women, I think, are subjected to a different kind of criteria than men are. Men can age gracefully. Cary Grant, I think, is the greatest. Clark Gable, the old stars. I mean, they, they acted until they died <laughs> in their old age. And there aren't many women like that. You think of who they might. Angela Lansbury is a favorite of mine. And she's, what, 93 or something, 94 now. And is acting up until last year. I don't know if she's still working. But I mean, there are women who can do it. But that's because she's so powerful. She has produced her own television series, has the money in the back to pretty much do what she wants. There aren't many performers who have reached that pinnacle that she has. Yes, I think they start to get thin in the grounds. In the UK, we've got people like Judy Dench, who's in her 80s now. Mm -hmm. um, I think Helen Mirren would yes. probably be in that category. I think she's in her 70s. You know, so I think in a way it's loosened up a bit. It has changed, but you have to build a lot of power to have that level of control. Yeah, and you can count them on one hand or maybe two if you're lucky. Yeah, I think there's still so much discussion of what these women see stars, what they do with their bodies, what they are socially permitted to do and expected to do, and often being hauled over the coals for doing something they're expected to do that they get criticized for not doing. And what are they meant to do? You know, because I think there's instances of, or there are mentions of facelifts and geoplastic surgery and that sort of thing quite a bit in the book. And these are just necessities that especially Hollywood stars have had to meet. But yet, even today, the headlines are very derogatory towards people who do anything cosmetic with their bodies. There's still today pressure on people you know, when, when somebody's had 
a BAB, for example, to get that weight back off as soon as possible. And it feels quite glacial, any change in mindsets there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. In fact, there are pictures in the press of mostly women who have had bad plastic surgery. We don't see that, but men are having it too. You know, they are under the same pressure that women are to appear to be younger. How sad that is. I mean, the people you've mentioned and, and I've mentioned, even Catherine Hepburn, who worked almost to the end, was old and grizzled and beautiful. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a different standard, perhaps, that we need to evolve to where the aging process is a thing of beauty, not something to be shunned and plastic surgerized out of existence. That's it. Yeah. I mean, there's so much talk now about body positivity and loving your body as it is. But yeah, it, there's still so much tension with you need to be this shape and that size and hide your wrinkles and dye your gray hairs and all of this stuff. I just want people to be able to breathe. Yes. It's a silly example, maybe, but I've been watching um, Star Trek Voyager and there's the character of Seven of Nine and played by Jerry Ryan. And she's squeezed into these corsets and she's made as tiny as possible and you know, in these skin tight outfits. And I just look at her and I think, gosh, that's really painful looking. And yet all these teenage boys 20 odd years ago were getting very excited of her, you know, and it's very strange to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the whole Barbie doll thing you know when I was a kid you could put your fingers around her waist easily you know with one hand the thumb and forefinger and what are we telling girls if that's the standard to which they have to uh, adhere you know it's unrealistic and not very healthy I might add be part of the conversation with AV Cultures Pod on Twitter Instagram and Facebook Pam, was there anything else you'd like to tell us about some of your other work as well while we're chatting? Um, you know, because you've mentioned your psychology background and your autobiography as well. And, you know, is there anything else you'd like to point out that might be interesting for listeners to think about too? Well, I think as a writer, I've pushed myself beyond <clears throat> my comfortable limits writing fiction and writing plays for that matter. And I would suggest to people that they do the same thing, that they make the best use of themselves they can, to use themselves up, so to speak, to access all their skills and develop some they didn't know they had, to, and it sounds corny, but to live life as fully as possible because it's a, it's a carpe diem world. You know, we don't know how long we have and why not take advantage of what you do have and make the most of it, whether it's helping other people or, you know, writing books like I do in essays. I have essays up the wazoo on, on my website, pammunger.com, by the way. You want to why not? It's part of making life meaningful. And, you know, if you don't do it, who will? That's great. Yes. Because I, I was going to ask you as well, if you had any maybe advice or just anything you've learned over the years, as you say, you were, um, you've met so many and spent time with so many of these types of celebrity before. And I mean, if there was somebody who, who's maybe aspiring to or is just starting out in the entertainment industry, as well as um, those really important messages you've just said, you know, is there any advice you would give to anyone in that position? Well, I think what we've learned from at least the stories in Fading Fame is the importance of getting an education. When I was a kid, I thought that walking down Sunset Boulevard or going to the Brown Derby would mean I would be discovered, you know, and some talent agent would come up to me and say, you're the one I want for my next movie. Well, there's still some of that fantasy, I think, going on among young actors that if they put themselves in certain settings, they will be discovered. Well, if that ever, is ever going to happen, you need to get grounded in education first. And I mean standard education. I don't just mean actor studio education. I mean a good liberal arts education. So you have a sense of how the world is, not just your little world or the world of show business, but all of it. And it will also stand you in good stead when the fame starts to fade. If you're ever fortunate enough to be famous, it'll give you something more to it than just seeing your name in a marquee. And sadly, the women in my book, Fading Fame, that's all they wanted. And pretty much all they got, for the most part, wasn't enough. It's our responsibility to fill our life responsibly, I think. Those are really excellent points. That puts me in mind again of so many of the characters in the stories, they don't understand their own downfall quite a lot of the time, because as you say, there's not that basic education. They don't understand the mass around the money that is disappearing on. They don't understand what because they don't have basic legal understanding either. And again, it calls to mind for me the um, character of Geraldine Leonard 
who has the humility to go and get a job in a typing pool yeah. when her work dries up. I mean, I love that about her. I love that she just didn't care. She just, oh, I need a job. I could do that. And she had had that education to be able to do that. You know, I really love that part in the story. She had her feet on the ground. And a lot of these women, sadly, did not. She was a good example of that. She knew what she had to do. And she went and answered fan mail for an actor who was more famous than she would ever be. Again, as you say, humility. That's really nice to see in somebody who's almost famous. She wasn't quite famous, but almost famous. Yeah, and we so often forget about actors who play the smaller characters or supporting characters. It was so lovely as well to just have it. I really, I think that was my favorite story. I just, uh, I just raced through it because I just loved her so much. You know, I just wanted to give her a cuddle or something. <laughs> I really admired her, you know, that she'd been a supporting actor to a much bigger actor and was doing a, a lot of work in Westerns and then TV Westerns. I, was that a bit of a reference to Rawhide? No, no, it was probably before Rawhide. And okay. It was, uh, I I think probably early 50s is where I, I had her having her career at small studios. I think if she'd been on Rawhide, she would have been more famous, really. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have that happen to her. I liked her too. I liked her a lot as I was writing her. And, uh, you know, sad that her mental faculties were declining. And as you say, I wanted, part of me wanted to go in and say, it's okay. It's okay. This is going to happen to you and you'll be all right. And everybody cares about you and, you know. Just a lovely person, I think. Yeah, I think she was awesome. And because it was sad in a way, the dementia and how that affects her. But her attitude was just so lovely and positive that he just thought, oh, she's awesome. She's just so awesome. She doesn't know how awesome she is. It's great. <laughs> I really fell in love with her. She seemed to accept anything, you know, whether it was famous or having to get a job or losing her faculties or having mismatched shoes or whatever it was. Nothing seemed to bother her very much. It's admirable, I think. I wish I were so in flower. Absolutely, yes. It felt like life goals. It's a really lovely example, actually, that she wasn't bothered. That she just, oh, I think I have a choose some. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked that one. Yeah, I did. I wrote, actually. It was one of the last ones I wrote. I felt I needed to have something like Ethel, you know, where the person is clearly coming to the end. Ethel was not declining mentally, but she was declining physically. But Jerry had uh, some issues with dementia, as you say. And it didn't diminish her enjoyment of her life, though, as you say. It was uh, inspiring that she could look back and still wonder what happened in certain instances and, and still miss the man she loved and was with. and uh, Just good memories that she had, which is wonderful. I would hope that we would all have good memories in our 80s. Yeah, or be a total hero like Maggie. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. Pam, is there anything else you'd like to chat about today? Anything we haven't got to that you really want to say? Well, I could tell you how it all started, really, the writing. Thing. Oh, yeah. It's weird. It's strange. When I was a little girl, there was uh, Republic Studios and Monogram Studios, which are B at C studios at best, sold their entire film load to television stations, which were having trouble filling the content. And so they would show old movies all the time. And one time I saw a movie and I was just captivated by the people in the film. They were teenagers and I was just a kid. I was probably eight, nine, maybe. And then I saw it. A couple of weeks later, there was another film with the same cast on TV. And every time after that, I saw it was in TV Guide, which is what we used in those days. I would somehow get sick. You know, I would get a headache or I just couldn't bring myself to go to school. I would come up with some faux illness so I could stay home and watch these movies. And there were a whole bunch of them. And I couldn't figure out who they were and how many there were. And when I got older and started to do this writing about people, I looked up the cast, which you could do e more easily at that point, you know, years later, decades later. And I found that the star of the, these movies was Freddie Stewart. And it's probably the only thing he ever did were these eight movies starring, quote, the teenagers, two words. Uh, and it was, had the same cast. June Pricer was in it. I wanted to write about him and I wanted to write about them because it was unfinished business from my childhood. Who were they? Well, the only person left alive was Noel Neal, who is best known as the original Lois Lane of Superman fame. And she was still alive. She was in her 70s, I think, by the time we met. And I spent a lot of time with, actually, we became friends, a lot of time asking about these movies 
Well, they were all shot in two weeks. <laughs> this wasn't rocket science. This wasn't Metro Golden Mayor, if you know what I mean. They'd get the thing and they'd, if they made a mistake, they'd just keep going. <laughs> they'd just roll right over the mistake. And I think it was that that got me interested in knowing more about these people from my own childhood that I saw on television and in movies that transfixed me for some reason. Freddie Stewart had a glorious, a contra soprano voice. He sounded male, certainly, but it was very high and clarion. And in fact, one of the songs he sang, Penthouse Serenade, was one of the songs I did on stage in New York when I was performing, because it was like a, an ode to him. You know, it made such a difference in my life in so many ways. I met his daughter, and you know, he was long dead by the time I was writing. But it's little things in life you can grab onto like that and value, and uh, you can change your life. Gosh, you just had so many experiences. Well, you're supposed to. <laughs> Part of being alive. <laughs> it's supposed to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make it interesting, yeah. You've been so generous with your time and your stories and everything. And um, it's been so interesting to hear about that process of doing the historic research and carrying it with you for such a long time um, and then doing something creative with it. That's a really interesting approach. And hopefully it will attract people who maybe aren't too bothered about reading history or biographies or anything, but might go for those you know, if they're framed as stories and, you know, they're pretty quick to read as well. You know, you can sit down and read one um, in not that long an amount of time and you know, it's very digestible and they stay with you. I think they're, you know, they're visually, I think, quite striking too. So it's been really great to hear just about that creative process, but also just the background that you're coming from and the, you know, the psychology of these people and what they what they were negotiating with in their own minds as well as in the outside world. I can't thank you enough for taking so much time. Oh, thank you for having me. Let me put in a plug for Fading Fame. It's available on Amazon.com. Also as an ebook as well as a paperback. So if your listeners are interested in knowing more about some of these stories, they can find it at the end of their keyboard. Brilliant. And I will be sure to put those links for the book and for your website in our show notes wherever people are finding this as well. So you've no excuse but to go and check them out. Oh, great. Pam Munter, it's been just such a pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed spending this time with you. And thank you so much for your generosity with your time and ideas and taking so much out of your morning. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. This is a Cozy Peapod production with me, Paula Blair. The music is Common Ground by Airtone News under a 3.0 non-commercial Creative Commons license and is available at ccmixer.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating, subscribe and recommend audiovisual cultures to a friend. All of our contact details, socials, information, ways to listen and our mailing list sign up can be found on our website linked in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening and supporting. Take care and I'll catch you next time.